Hello, Bond fans, and welcome to another edition of My Weekly Bond. Uh, if you've been following these videos for a while, it's probably best that I should inform you now that this is essentially going to be a retconning of my original Weekly Bond Doctor No review. Why? Well, because my opinions of the film have changed quite drastically over the past few months, and, you know, watching it again, there's new things to talk about. There's always new things to talk about in Bond, which is absolutely fabulous. And, um, well, my last review was... Well... Hello everyone, and welcome to my first Weekly Bond. Please don't hold that title against me, I can't do any better, I'm rubbish with titles. Christ, I'm more wooden than George Lazenby. Uh, anyway, uh, today, yes, we're going to be looking at the first uh, feature-length James Bond screen adventure, Doctor No. The film opens with a series of bizarre electronic beeping noises before we have the classic gun barrel sequence with stuntman Bob Simmons as Pond and not Connery, and then it's straight into the credits. No pre-title sequence this time, folks, though for some reason I do think it's really quite appropriate that the first film in the series opens with a blaring rendition of the, uh, of the James Bond theme. There's something really fitting about it, and obviously the James Bond theme is a fantastic piece of music. It's wonderful... Uh, um... Uh, wait, wait, uh, excuse me me, dear, I think you're in the wrong film. Um, uh, what? Uh, are these the credits for the same film? Uh, let's try for some cohesion next time, Maurice. We then get into the movie proper, where we see British intelligence agent in Jamaica John Strangways murdered by a trio of assassins known as the Three Blind Mice, or Tree Blind Mice, as the song says. Uh, they also kill his secretary with the help of a really obviously placed jump cut. We'll see a lot of jump cuts and the like during these early films of the series, and let me go on record and say that I hate them. I know editor Peter Hunt justified them as adding pace and speeding up the action, but to me they just look lazy, like if there's a problem with a shot, cut around it, reshoot it if it's that bad. A jump cut just really takes me out of the story and the characters. We see a bunch of people in an office talking about the trouble in Jamaica, and it's decided that there's just one man who needs to be called to sort this out. We then have an introduction scene that requires, well, no introduction. Uh, this scene is truly a piece of iconic cinema. I admire your luck. Mr. Bond. James Bond. Oh, it gives you the chills, doesn't it? I went into detail about this scene in my top Bond introductions video, so I won't talk about it much more here. The scene also introduces us to uh, Miss Sylvia Trench, played by Eunice Gason, voiced by Nikki Vandersil. Quite why the voice was dubbed, I don't know. Eunice sounds fine to me when we hear her real voice uh, used in this clip of the trailer. I decided to accept your invitation. I decided to accept your invitation. Just as things were getting interesting. Again. Just as things were getting interesting again. Next, we're introduced to one of the few women in this film not to have their voice dubbed by a different actress, Miss Moneypenny, played by Lois Maxwell, in a scene that truly defines the Bond and Moneypenny relationship and is still one of the best Bond slash Moneypenny scenes. After that, we're introduced to a rather crusty M, played by Bernard Lee, who gives Bond his mission for the film. Uh, Bond displays a certain level of contempt for M in this scene, especially when he is instructed to trade in his Beretta for a Walther PPK, uh, which adds to Bond's character nicely. He he clearly has respect for M, and he's going to obey, but he's not going to pretend to be happy about something if he isn't. Oh, by the way, Bond receives his new gun from Major Boothroyd, played by Peter Burton here. It's weird to think that this uh, really quite thankless character in this film would eventually evolve into, well, one of the most beloved mainstays of the 007 franchise when played by Desmond Llewellyn. And another thing. Since I've been head of MI7, there's been a 40% drop in double O operative casualties, and I wanted to stay that way. Sorry, what was that? M? Did you say MI7? But this is MI6! This has always really puzzled me. I mean, obviously M's mouth says MI6, but they dub it with MI7, and I don't know why, especially as characters later on in the film refer to it as MI6, rightfully. It's confused me since I was 10 years old. Does anyone know why they did that? 
Bond arrives home to find a half-dressed Sylvia waiting for him, and so she becomes the first woman Bond beds in the series. Quite how she got into Bond's apartment is uh, questionable. You'd think it'd be tricky to break into the apartment of a top super spy, but Sylvia is obviously a very skilled woman. Bond arrives in Jamaica, and we get a lot of shots of suspicious-looking people, including Bond's chauffeur, who it turns out is actually a double agent. Bond finds this out ahead of time by phoning the government house, and I love the look on Connery's face when he finds out that the guy's actually a double. It's such a look of... Right, I'm going to have some fun with this then. It tells us a lot about Bond's character, and I love that he doesn't just escape or run away or confront the double agent at the airport. He waits until they're both alone, out in the middle of nowhere, and then takes care of it, which accuse the first fight scene of the series. It's interesting to note here that if you look closely, you can see Bond's knuckles a uh, red raw here. Everyone credits Craig's Bond as being the first one to get bruised, beat up, and injured from fight scenes, but really, it's right here in Doctor No, the very first Bond film. Bond gets to the embassy and starts his investigation by checking out Strangway's home. Oh yes, that's a blood patch. They've grouped it as O-R-H positive. Uh, thanks for that pointless piece of information. I'll be sure to file it and uh, not relative to anything. Uh, w wait a minute, is that Tiger Tanaka's voice? We tried to get through on the same frequency, but it was dead the other end. Who's the man with Strangways? Another jump cut? Really? Couldn't you at least have tried to edit around that? Bond enjoys his first shaken, not stirred vodka martini at his hotel. Or, or should I say mixed, not stirred? And, you know, actually Bond does a bit of spy stuff here before he leaves the hotel. This would be something of a rarity in future installments, but here Bond puts talcum powder on uh, his case uh, openers, and uh, he puts a hair on his wardrobe door so that he'll know if anyone's been snooping around in his room while he's been away. Uh, again, this tells us a lot about Bond's character, showing him methodically putting these careful procedures in place. He's not not paranoid, but it's his job to be cautious. Bond meets with Strangway's uh, bridge friends, including a Professor Dent played by Anthony Dawson, and finds out Strangway's had been quite into fishing recently, and goes to meet with the fisherman who had been taking Strangways out on the trips, Quarrel, played by John Kitzmiller, who is without a doubt one of the best and most endearing of Bond's male allies in the entire series. But in what becomes something of an annoying trope of the Bond films, we're first led to believe that Quarrel is a baddie, as he refuses to answer Bond's questions, and instead takes Bond into the back room of a bar. Hey, man, you see we get a bit of privacy. Nothing but, Quarrel, nothing but. <laughs> Kinky. We have a little fight between Bond, Quarrel, and a man named Pussfella, and then are introduced to Felix Leiter, played by Jack Lord. It'll take another good few incarnations before anyone even comes close to being as good as Jack Lord in this role, and even then, Lord doesn't exactly set fires alight in this role. Felix pales in comparison when it comes to other Bond allies like Quarrel, Karen Bay, even Joe Don Bloody Baker. After the scuffle, everyone is revealed to be friends, and they decide to catch up on the Strangway situation over drinks at Pussfella's nightclub. Whoa, is he... Is is that guy all right? I mean, he looks like he's having some kind of stroke. Does someone want to call someone? The photographer from the airport reappears and Bond sends Quarrel to find her. Oh god, him again. Look, will someone please help that man? Someone, anyone? He's obviously having a bad reaction to drink or drugs or something. What kind of alcohol are you serving here, puss fella? The photographer is interrogated, but reveals nothing except for how much of a badass Quarrel is. Like, she slashes half of his face off, and he's just like, do you want me to break her arm? Uh, but suspicion is raised about an island known as Crab Key and its inhabitant, Dr. No. Later, Bond returns to his hotel when the three blind mice appear, ready to strike. Wanna play that a little louder, Monty? 
Bert Bond lives to die another day and meets with Professor Dent the next morning, where it becomes clear that there's more to this man than meets the eye. And indeed, the next scene is him scurrying over to Crab Key. Dent is an effective secondary villain and gives us someone to boo and hiss at in the meanwhile, as Dr. No ain't appearing for another three quarters of an hour, folks. It's on Crab Key that Dr. No provides Dent with a weapon for killing Bond, a weapon so frightening that grown men weep over this thing daily, a weapon so destructive nations have surrendered over just the very thought of such a thing, a weapon so so, uh, ooh, what a lovely set. Oh, well done, Ken Adam. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes, uh, Dr. No provides Dent with a tarantula. Wait, what? But tarantulas aren't lethal to humans, are they? I mean, unless the plan is to scare Bond to death with the thing, I'm pretty sure a silenced firearm would have been more effective. Why not just get the tree-blind mice on the job. Anyway, uh, the next scene shows Bond in bed with the tarantula. Look at Eva, Bond, there's a giant pane of glass separating the two of them. The spider is flipped off the bed, and Bond takes heed from the Looney Tunes and bashes the thing to death in time with the music. If only all Bond films provided cartoon sound effects to Bond's actions. <laughs> Wait, a lot of them already do. The next day, Bond heads to the embassy to talk and ends up making a date with this Chinese... Uh... Um... English? Uh... What nationality is she supposed to be exactly? Uh, anyway, Bond suspects that she's a double agent, so makes a date with her. Uh... Wait a minute, why is there a window in the middle of the room? That evening, Bond heads to his date with the suspected double agent and gets into his first car chase of the series, and... <sighs> well, technology and advancements in filming have come a long, long, long way since this scene was filmed. The terrible back projection robs this scene of any excitement or tension, and you'd think they could do it for real. I mean, earlier on, they clearly filmed Connery actually riding in a car, and I guess we're supposed to assume that the tree-blind mice are in the car chasing, despite never getting a shot of them? And why the hell does that car blow up so easily? All it's doing is slowly rocking down a hill. I'd be surprised if such a tumble even damaged the suspension. Seriously, what would cause such an explosion? Is everyone doused in gasoline? Don't worry, men. We're all okay so long as no one lets a match. What did he say? Well, you did invite me, remember? Uh, oh, of course. I just didn't expect you here so soon. Yes, yes, come in. I'll just go and put some clothes on. I don't go to any trouble. Yep, that's it, James. Just force a kiss on the girl. Consent is just a term feminists use to emasculate real red-blooded men like yourself. But it's okay, because she's a baddie. So Bond sleeps with her, because, well, why not? And then she's arrested. Well, I guess Bond sleeping with her does tell us more about Bond as a character. He knows that she's bad, and he knows that he's going to arrest her, but he's just going to get what pleasure he can out of her while she's there. The next scene is another character-defining one, and one that many Bond fans refer to as being classic Bond, and I agree. Bond setting up the rooms, calmly playing solitaire, and shooting Dent in cold blood is probably the best scene in the film. It also shows Bond's first kill with his new Walther PPK. To say this is such an iconic scene, such scenes are quite rare in the series, actually, but then it'd be hard to imagine Roger Moore doing this scene and looking as cool as Connery does. That night, Bond and Quarrel head out to Crab Key to investigate and sleep by the beach. Come morning, we get the other, more widely recognised iconic scene of Doctor No when Ursula Andrews steps out of the water, causing many an erection the world over. Hmm, doesn't look like I'll be buggering Quarrel after all. It's all right. I'm not supposed to be here either. I take it you're not. Are you alone? What are you doing here? Looking for shells? No, I'm just looking. Stay where you are. I promise I won't steal your shells. I promise you you won't either. 
While that may sound trivial, shell theft is actually the number one crime on Crab Key. Shell dealers are a powerful criminal organization. Hey man, you got any of them shells for sale? Maybe I have. Oh come on man, you know me, you know I'm good for the money. How much you willing to offer? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give fifty dollars. Fifty? This ain't Miami, man. These will cost you a hundred. Okay, okay, just, just please give me, give, give me the shells, give me the shells. Okay, okay, kid, here you go, here are the shells. Uh, lovely shells. Anyway, the lady is of course Honey Ryder, the Bond girl for this film, and one of the most iconic women, no, actually one of the most iconic characters in a Bond film ever. She and Bond get introduced before Quarrel runs over alerting them to a patrol boat. Hmm, gee, I wonder what could have given them away. I mean, in those clothes, these guys are practically invisible to the naked eye. They blend right into the scenery. The patrol leaves and our intrepid heroes, including Honey, whose boat has been destroyed, head inland in search of Dr. No, despite Honey and Quarrel's fears of a dragon who supposedly lives there.